Good morning. Hear me all right? It feels really wonderful to be back in the tabernacle. Uh, in the light of other days, I can see our family sitting up there in the second pew on the, well, from here, the left in the balcony next to the Moon family. I can see my grandmother Elsie sitting right about there with her sister Alice. And uh, it's just, it, this is a wonderful church. And the class of 1964, which is the honor class on the platform today, most of us were born in 1946. And so that was the beginning of the baby boom. And I have to say something that I didn't say back then, which is how much I appreciate what this church did for that school. Because uh, I'm, I remember when I started in elementary school, we would, uh, if it was a rainy day, we would play recess in the lobby, the present lobby. And, uh, you know, kickball was always, they were always endangering the paintings on the wall. And the, I think I broke a window myself there in the foyer uh, when I was in second or third grade. But the church got together and got the money, made a, a wonderful gymnasium. I think Mr. Perkins designed it and it was built. And so from then on, when it was rainy and nasty outside, we had a great place to play. I'll remember, I still remember the smell of the varnish on the floors that first day when I got into the gym and many days after that. Also built three more classrooms for the elementary students because there was this bulge of children coming through with a baby boom and we needed more room. And they also added a wonderful chapel. So what I didn't say then, I'm saying now, thank you to this wonderful church for the support that it gave to the academy and to all of us as we were going through. Now today's speaker is uh, Carol Scully Thompson. Uh, she came to our class as Carol Scully, at the age of 15, and her parents were missionaries in South America when she had joined us. She uh, became our beloved classmate and graduated with us in 1964. And from there she went on to Andrews, where she met Pastor Irwin Thompson. And they were married here in the Tabernacle in, I think, 1966. And at, the after, uh, at Andrews there, after Andrews, she went on to uh, take nurses training at Henry Ford College. She was an ICU nurse for 10 years. And then she changed careers and became a licensed psychotherapist. And she now maintains a private practice as a psychotherapist and life coach in Sonora, California. She has a nine-month-old granddaughter, and uh, you see her at the potluck. I'm sure she'd be glad to show you pictures. And uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce and reintroduce to you Carolyn Scully Thompson. Good morning. Down. Okay, that was a test. I'm not a preacher. But in the book of Titus, it says, let the old women teach. <laughs> so today I'll be teaching the class of 2014. I saw you when you stood up. But the rest of you better listen in because there'll be an exit exam at the end. When I was 13 years old, my missionary parents allowed me to go to a boarding school in the northern nothingness of Argentina. For some strange reason, the girls' dorm was called the chicken coop. We didn't have heat, but we had hot water on Fridays. When the dining room blew down, we ate in a tent for a year. One of the school rules was that the boys were not allowed to speak to the girls, ever, except in the dining room, a uh, tent which was heavily patrolled by the Gestapo. <laughs> Not to worry, young people are very resourceful. The whole school was paired up in an elaborate note-passing scheme and hand signals. You know, you can actually sit in church and signal somebody, never mind. When I was 15 years old, I came to Battle Creek Academy. Thank you, Jesus. The teachers were dedicated. They taught us to have life goals, and they gave us a moral compass in case we wanted to use it. 
Here, the boys were definitely speaking to the girls. Don't worry, class of 64, your secrets are safe. Because I have repressed almost the entire three years. <laughs> Except for speaking mostly Spanish as I did, I asked how to say a certain something in English, and I was told, and I said it in class. No, 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 wrong word. Everyone had a good laugh, except the teacher. And then I was sitting in front of algebra class. Apparently it had been rumored that I turned sweet 16 and never been kissed by a boy. Well, I'm not going to tell you whether that was true or not. But a boy who shall remain unnamed but was a twin came up and planted a slobbering kiss on my cheek. As I ran out of the classroom to wash my face, everyone was amused, but I was confused because in my old school, he would have been expelled. There were many random acts of kindness, like the girl who gave me a sack of her previously occupied clothes because I was poor. And then there was Jorgen, who was taking one of the Kardashian girls to one of those non-prom events we called a banquet. But he bought me a corsage because I didn't have a date. When graduation time came, they gave us career advisement. No, your scores show that you cannot become an RN. You could be a nurse's aide. Then she measured me for a graduation cap. Oh, I heard her mumble, your head is as big as the boys. Horrified, I looked down at the list, but I was greatly relieved to see that our illustrious, smart, talented, essay, and class president, Steve Spruill's head was bigger than mine. <laughs> Eventually, I learned that everyone has a measuring stick. And they're always voting you up or down. Ooh, you bought those sunglasses at Walmart, they look like five dollars. You must be a two. Woo, that's your fancy car? You must be a 10. Okay, sweetie, do you know that 28 Adventist beliefs and the secret ones that vary from church to church? You don't? You must be a zero. So in life, we develop our own measuring stick, and we choose an area to excel in so that we can have a sense of significance. Some people choose to be significant in power, like wealth or votes. Some people choose to be significant in popularity, like beauty or sports or fame. And some people choose to be significant in prestige, like getting a lot of education and piling it higher and deeper, and they give you a PhD, and you can be king of the smart mountain. The problem is that time and circumstances and people have a way of voting us down. Last year, over 4,000 youth measured themselves and committed suicide. One in six thought about it. In the book, The Honor Code, How Moral Revolutions Happen, Kwame Apia, professor of philosophy at Princeton, tells us that human beings need others with this 
others to respond with esteem to who we are and what we do. We need to have others recognize us as living successful lives. But who sets the standard? And who grants the respect and honor? And if we fail to meet their ideal, who imparts contempt? And who feels shame? And for how long? The need for honor can motivate good or bad behavior. Some people murder women and call it honor killing. What are the values that should guide our life? And how do we decide what is truth? You know, research has shown that 85% of Americans have a sense of low self-worth or failure in one or more key areas of life. So what is the solution? I'm going to tell you four short stories. Let's see if we can figure it out. Story number one. A 17-year-old boy was terribly bullied by his older brothers. One day, things got out of hand. And through a series of unfortunate circumstances, he ended up living in another country. For 20 years, he did not see his family. One day, his boss's wife, a cougar-type woman, offered. When he declined, he learned the fury of a woman scorned. So class, what was Joseph thinking when Potiphar threw him into prison for something he hadn't done? Maybe he was thinking, you know those dreams I had when I was a kid and I thought they were messages from God and my brothers were all bowing to me? Maybe that was just acid indigestion. I was abandoned as a toddler by my mother. I was abandoned into a deep pit by my brothers and now God has abandoned me into this prison one year, two years, three years in the prime of my life for something I didn't do. It's not fair. But no, Joseph kept believing and following God, even though he didn't know the rest of his story, that he would hear from God again, that he would become ruler of Egypt, save the nations from starvation. And after his brothers had all bowed to him, he got to say, you intended it for evil, but God intended it for good. Story number two. Two countries were at war. A very young man was taken prisoner. As part of his re-education, he was fixed. You know, like they do the dogs, no family for him. Years later, he was sentenced to a horrible death. His crime, talking to God. So class, what was Daniel thinking as they carried him to the lion's den? Besides, this is really gonna hurt. Daniel had heard from God many times, but now all he heard were hungry lions. Maybe he was thinking, I never got to go back to my own country. I never got to have a family. I stayed loyal to God all my lonely life. And this is how it ends? Maybe if I tell him I don't believe anymore, I can still save myself. But no. Daniel kept believing and following God. Even though he didn't know the rest of his story, that he would hear from God again, 
that he would write part of the Bible, and every Christian child would know the story of Daniel and the frustrated lions. Story number three. Years ago, a widow teacher in a small Adventist school met her nine-year-old granddaughter for the first time. They spent some time together. The girl had frequent stomach aches, and grandma would rub her feet, and the stomach aches would go away. Grandma was very patient with nine-year-old antics. Then the girl had to go home, and grandma died. When the girl was 12 years old, an older girl talked her into running away from home. They were going to sneak out of church, take the bus on the corner to the train station, and go to the big city. As they were planning this, the young girl thought about it and said, you know, how are we going to support ourselves? I haven't got any money. Oh, don't worry, said the older girl. You're blonde and have blue eyes. You'll get plenty of jobs. And the young girl was very naive, so she didn't get it. But as they were planning this, the young girl heard from God. But it was disguised as her grandmother's voice. I would be so disappointed if you did this. Running away from home would be wrong. I hope to see you in heaven someday. And so when the day came, the older girl ran away from home without me. I thought about my grandmother years later when I belonged to a support group for women who had been abused as children. Every week we got together and told stories and cried. It was depressing. But I had to show up because I was their therapist. Then I learned that I could invite Jesus into their memories. He would speak his truth, heal their emotions, and free them from a trauma-based self-image. And so one by one, they were healed. No more group. Because when the sun sets you free, you are free indeed. John 8, 36. My grandmother died rather young, never knowing the rest of her story, never knowing that when she rubbed my feet, she was saving my soul and altering the course of my life. Who can measure the influence of a teacher that follows God or the power of a little love and patience? My grandmother continued to influ influence my life and in turn, the lives of others. Story number four. There was a group of men who you, if you measured them, you would find them to lie cheat, swear, be impulsive cowards, and not very smart. Not the kind of men you'd want hanging around your church. Yet these are the ones to whom Jesus said, follow me, and made them his closest friends. Several times he told them, I'm going to die and then be resurrected. And then he died, and the disciples were sad. Because after all those sermons and miracles, they didn't really get it. It says that they were so disappointed, they cried. And they said, we thought he was going to be our savior, but now our God is dead. Then Jesus was resurrected, and 
he appeared in various times to them, and it says that a week later, they still couldn't believe it was him. Jesus said to them, Blessed are they who have not seen him and yet believe. After a while, he said, Now I'm going back up to heaven, but I'm going to send you a part of God to be in you and with you. And when the Holy Spirit came, their life was transformed. They did miracles, they taught, and thousands were converted. And it says the people that knew them were astounded because they knew them to be uneducated and untrained. Yet the leaders measured them and found them worthy to be beaten, stoned, jailed, hated, and in the end, martyred. Jesus had told them the rest of their story. Because you have believed and followed me, I have reserved for you 12 thrones in heaven. Matthew 19, 28. What the people in the four stories have in common is a two-way relationship with God that brought them comfort, guidance, and love. Even when bad things happened to good people, they continued to believe and follow God, regardless of how humans measured them or voted them up or down. What we can learn from these stories is that God desires a two-way relationship with us in, in which we hear him, sense his presence, and know his providential workings in our life. Christian apologist Ravi Zacharias, who has lectured at most of the great universities of the world and has written 20 books, answers the question raised earlier by Professor Appia. What is truth and how do we find it? He states that while every religion makes claims about truth, the Christian faith is unique in its ability to answer four questions. Our origin, meaning of life, morality, and our destiny. Dr. Dr. Zacharias concludes that those answers are found in looking at the life and teachings of the one who claimed to be the truth. Jesus Christ who said, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. John 8, 32. Instead of seeking significance in power, if we know that truth, we will experience the power of God's love. Like Joseph, have you been bullied? Have those who are supposed to love you and protect you cast you into a deep pit of despair or maybe even abandoned you? How many unfair events can you count in your life we all have our list. In the, if in the midst of difficult times, we can sense the loving presence of God, it will make a profound difference in our life. Maybe we will hear him whisper in our mind, I have loved you with everlasting love. Then instead of seeking significance in popularity, or people pleasing, we can enjoy friendship with God. Like Daniel, have you been lonely? Is there a void in your life that you've never been able to fill no matter what you try? Maybe he will speak his truth to you, though the mountains be shaken and the hills be removed. Yet my unfailing love for you will not be shaken, nor my covenant of peace be removed, says the Lord who has compassion on you. Isaiah 54.10.
If you're older like my grandma and have followed God all your life, maybe you're wondering if it's, your life has really made a difference in other people's lives. You can have the assurance that God has a plan for your life and he is carrying it out as you let him be your, your guide and comforting friend. Finally, instead of seeking significance and prestige, which in the end doesn't really satisfy, you can have the privilege of a relationship with Emmanuel, which means God with us. Then the Holy Spirit will fill your life and those who know you best will know that your life is being transformed. So class, what is your story? Most epic stories that last the test of time have four parts. The main character, the villain, the hero, and the rescue that leads to living happily ever after. In your story, do not underestimate the part that you play or let the supporting characters measure you or vote you down. If you don't know who the villain is, your life will be confusing. The villain wants to steal your story, but most of all, the villain wants you to blame the hero for the villain's part in your story. The hero's part is not readily obvious. You have to listen and watch you have to get to know the hero's story if you want to be rescued and live happily ever after. So class, how does your story end? Everyone in this room is in the pre-death stage of life. No one escapes the next stage, and some of us are very close. Jesus would like to write the ending of your story. He says, you know, I have measured you, and I have found you to be the love of my life. I would like to be your rescuing hero. Therefore, I'm inviting you to a real banquet in heaven. I will seat you at my table and I will come and serve you. Luke 12, 37. If you accept his invitation, when he brings you your food, take a close look at his hands, his story, and your significance are engraved on the palms of his hands. In closing, because they told me I was only going to have 20 minutes, so <laughs> more time for potluck. In closing, there's one more person to whom Jesus said, follow me. He had power, he had popularity, and he had prestige. But we know that the man whose portrait is painted on the wall behind me did not follow Jesus. As you look at the picture of Jesus and the rich young ruler, do you wonder what the rest of his story might have been? Okay, class, it's time for the final exam. 
You ready? Don't worry, there's only one question. But so that you can better think of the correct answer, I'm asking you now to bow your head and close your eyes. It will serve as our benediction. Jesus is asking you this question. I love you so much. In spite of everything that has happened to you, would you believe and follow me even though you don't know the rest of your story? <laughs>